people continue to come in, we will admit them. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for your patience and welcome to the Haitian American Museum of Chicago. Our program tonight is called Dusable Who? The Untold Story of Chicago's Founder, presented with Mr. Mark O. Rosier. This program is a part of our scholar series at the museum, which is a series that explores history and culture from Haiti, African, and diasporic perspectives. My name is Carlos Bossard and I'm the executive director of the museum. Also tonight, we are joined by the president and founder of the museum, Ms. Elsie Hector Hernandez. It is great to see you all again. Thank you so much for joining us. Hammock's mission is to promote Haitian art, culture and history in metropolitan Chicago and surrounding communities nationally and internationally through advocacy, education and supportive services. Education is at the core of our mission, and we are glad to continue bringing insightful, meaningful, and impactful lectures and programs to the community. Before we begin, I do want to do a little bit of housekeeping and let you all know the format of tonight's event. First, this program is being recorded, and if you do not wish to be seen on the recording, feel free to turn off your video cameras now. Also, all of you were automatically put on mute as you entered the room please remain on mute throughout the program to make sure that everyone can hear clearly. Also, auto-generated captioning has been turned on for accessibility. The transcript is available after the program if you would like it. Also, after the presentation, there will be a Q&A session with Mr. Rosier, moderated by Hammock's educator and grant writer, Ben Henderson. Ben has been with the museum for over two years now and continues to be a huge asset, supporter, and friend to the museum. Ben. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Ben Henderson, and I'm the educator and grant writer at the Haitian American Museum of Chicago. As Carl states, the Q&A will take place after the presentation. However, feel free to put your questions in the chat during the presentation for Mr. Rosier to answer after the presentation. During the Q&A, all questions must be asked through the chat. I'll be monitoring questions throughout and relaying them to Dr. Rosier. For those not familiar with Mark Rosier, He's a teacher and an independent scholar who wrote the book, Chicago's Authentic Founder, a biography on the life of Jean Point de Sable and the history of early Chicago. The work is a result of years of painstaking research and meticulous reading of primary sources. In doing so, Rosier creates a crisscrossing narrative that covers major historical events, such as the Seven Years' War, the American War of Independence, and the Haitian Revolution. And through the lens of de Sable, connects them to life in the Illinois frontier. For today's program, we'll be discussing the life of de Sable and how he came to Chicago. Everyone, please welcome Mr. Rosier. All right. Well, thank you, Ben. No problem. It's always a pleasure to talk about de Sable. <laughs> it's like, uh, I can never have enough, never, Kind of talking about him. So I don't know how many people in the audience actually have, have the book. She got an authentic founder. So I will assume some have the books and some do that. Do that. So the story is a very compelling story, the story of Busan. So we can understand a man who left where he was born in a warm climate in the Caribbean, at a time when he lived in an empire called New France. At that time, the French occupied lands here in, in North America, Canada, and the Midwest, and other parts of what is now the United States, and a lot of lands in the Caribbean. So the men travel all the way to Louisiana, and then up north over here in the Midwest. And, I, and why was he traveling? Apparently, his family who had been over here around 1718. So maybe he was looking for lost relatives. So he came over here looking for them. So when he got over here 
he started going south, the southern part of the, of the state of Illinois. Certain villages, there were French villages, Kaskaskia, Cahokia, St. Genevieve, Prairie du Rocher, Prairie du Chien. So there were many other French villages. And his people apparently were among those living in those villages. But something had happened just before he got here. The empire he heard about was no more. The French had fought a war with the British from 1754 to 1763 and lost. So the empire was gone. So Canada was, was given away. North America here where we live, in Illinois, Wisconsin, Missouri, and of course, Indiana, Michigan, Vermont. So what should he do? So he started looking for his people. So we don't know whether he found his people, but next time he resurfaces, we find him in Peoria. By that time, it's 1773. So he purchased land and built a house and began to grow crops and maybe getting ready to have a family. So, but other things happened. Then war again continued. The French and Indian War, that's the war that his empire lost and caused him to move around looking for his people. A new war came about because of this war also. A new war came about, that's the American Revolution. So then by 1778, the area he was occupying in Peoria where he purchased land. So that area too was under attack. George Rogers Clark came over and he occupied Illinois. So he took over a lot of the French villages. He, dis he dispatched people in the middle of the night to go to the different villages and took over. And so by that time, some of the French people were forced to become American or to take an, an oath of loyalty to the Commonwealth, Virginia or the 13 states the rebelling states. So what should Dusabo do? Well, he left. So that was 1778. Next time he resurfaced, so we find that he is, they're reporting that he is an, he is an occupant or a resident of Chicago. But where was Chicago? Who lived there? What was that? Nobody knew because that Chicago could be the river, Chicago River. It could be a very famous person. It could be many other rivers or many other areas in the, in the region. So nobody knew. So the British officers in Detroit, referring to him, Dusabo or Pensebo, handsome, smart, living in Chicago. He lives in Chicago. So that Chicago, nobody knew what it was exactly, but he was living, they said he was living there. And then 1779, he was arrested, but he was arrested in Indiana. We've heard the Chemin. So we find him arrested, but in Chicago where he was living, Many things were happening. The rebel states, they were sending letters to some chiefs, Mekigi. Those chiefs apparently were passing around. So this man, Dusabo, now a resident of a, of a place that nobody knew where it was, established a business. So the life he was living in Peoria, he transported over here. 
animals were brought over here. So many heads of animals were brought over here. He was farming. He was growing crops. He had 30 heads of adult horned animals. He had 20 head hogs. He had, he had 44 hens, not to mention horses. He had to build two stables. He had two barns. He had plow. So he had oxen, he had, he had axes, scythes, sickles, whip saw, plank saw, large saws, seven inches blade, cross cut saw, cooper hand saw, additional tools that were kept away. Why? He used those tools to build the two barns we talked about to house the animals. He built a poultry to house his chickens. He built a smoke house and a smoke pit to roast meat and to attract people to, to his area. He built a large capacity bakery. He baked bread to serve people from far and near. Visitors came to visit. They came to buy feet and feet of bread and, and roast pork and, and, and delicacies from him. And they leave records of how much they purchased from him. So the lake front was always busy. Chickens were clucking, cows were mowing, roosters were crawling, were crawling, bulls were bellowing. Mules were whining, dogs were offing and barking, pigs grunting and oinking, smoke rising and swirling, circulating, workers repairing and cutting wood, bakers mixing dough. Man, there is a lot going on in this area. Well, there was nothing before. So his people are spreading the word that there is a place called Chicago. Take the Chicago River and follow it down. When you get, if you, if you make it to the lake, you go too far. Just before you reach the lake, that's the establishment. Come here, get what you need. So a man named Hugh Heward came from Detroit. He came with a lot of people. They collected a lot of things from the subway and they left messages. They left, a, they left a record of what they bought. And then other people began to refer to the area as Chicago, a, a, a specific place on the map. Then something happened. Other people began to come in, in the area to do what? To trade with him. He is making friends with people who are influential people, founders of cities, like founders of St. Louis, 1764. His friends, people in Detroit, even before he was born, 1701 when Detroit was founded. He had relatives there. What's going on with him? He's got people in, in, in St. Louis, people in St. Charles, and some historians say his people also in St. Genevieve, in Kaskaskia, in Cahokia. So he's all over the states. But still, how should we refer to him? Because by 1800, other people began to come. The American government began to learn about the place. So they decided to build a fort. And where did they put the fort? Where is Chicago? Across the street from the business. I guess that must be Chicago, where he lived, where the business is. So whenever you say Chicago, so that means across the street from his house. He had barns, he had many buildings, he had a residence, he had all types of painting. He had furniture, modern furniture, he had literature. So Chicago became a place on the map 
a real place. Not a scat field, not the wild onion area, but a real place where people lived. There was no slavery because he was in charge. He, uh, he was a chief among the Indians, a Parwanami chief. He was in Detroit. When he was arrested, his fellow chiefs came and demanded that the British release him immediately. He got on a canoe, a parade. Many other chiefs were with him on the waters. The British had to salute him. Who was this man? Why was he doing all of this? Did he intend to build a city? But all of this is documented. Wherever he goes, there's documentation of what he did. 1800. What happened in 1800? Well, all his belongings, the property, an inventory was taken. Everything was listed. Everything that he said here was listed and it was recorded by people who would come later to purchase the property. John Kenzie recorded, was a witness. He also recorded the deed in Detroit. John Kenzie, that's the man they wanted to be the father of the city. Well, he killed the man DuSabo sold the property to. That was Lee May. Uh, Lee May, no, that's what his, Kenzie's daughter-in-law says. Actually, it was Lee Lim who purchased the property. Lee May was another man, Kenzie's son, Poison. James Kenzie poisoned this man. Who was this man? Francis May. Well, DuSabo tried to help this man. He was DuSabo's neighbor, possibly DuSabo's worker. When the founders of St. Louis, because of their friendship with DuSabo, decided to be godparents of, of DuSabo's granddaughter, Eulalia, DuSabo sent Suzanne, his daughter, to St. Louis to have the child baptized. He sent Francis May and his wife to go with them and to have their children baptized. And guess who was the godfather? It was Chuto. The Chutos were the founders of St. Louis. They own everything in St. Louis. They had big businesses. Everybody knew them. Everyone in St. Louis basically related to them. They worked for Jefferson. They worked for President Harrison. But they were also slave owners. So Dusabo left. Why? Well, maybe he got a hunch. Because if the man he sold the property to was murdered in cold blood at the gate of the fort, and the other man, Francis May, he had tried to help, was poisoned by the same family, maybe Dusabo knew something when he left. But that property he left became a, a springboard for the men who murdered all, for the family that murdered all these people because they opened their own business. The business was part of after DuSabo's business. So what should we call this DuSabo, the men who did all of this? His house that was left, that was sold, it was that one of it was a school now. It was a boarding house where actually the men who purchased it actually had borders. People paid to stay there. It was also a post office. So when other writers came around, they saying that he was the first citizen. He was the settler. Some even said that he was a squatter. What should we call him? The man who did all of this, what should he be called? Was he the founder? Is it a proper name for him? Is it a proper title? How should we weigh what he did? 
what more can you do to build a city? So if you bring population, you start a business, you spread the word, clients, customers are coming to purchase, people are taking residence around your business, and you employ people, and government officials from far away take notice, when they come to the area to establish their fort, to make their presence known, they come across the street from your house, from your business. Isn't that the work of a founder? You be the judge. What title? What should the Sussex title be? There's a debate today about what should he be called. What should be, how should we recognize him? The men who did all of this. I guess what I'm saying here is only what I'm saying. You need to go to the book, find Chicago's authentic founder, see for yourself what he has done. And then compare that to other people they say who founded places. And then try to put a number, a numeric value to what he has done and to what he come up with. And if you don't have the book, I suggest you find a copy. So, but for now, I'm, I'll be more than happy to answer some questions. But remember, you be the judge. What, what should he be called, the man who did all of this? Thank you. All right. Uh, great work, Dr. Ro Mr. Rosier. Um, okay. So, we don't have any questions in the chat just yet. So I'm gonna start with my own question to try to spur things on. All right, so um, you mentioned DeSabo might have had family here. Are you referring to like um, um, some of the first slaves that were brought here actually in Illinois? Yes, I'm referring to the group of slaves or people taken from Haiti and brought to the area to work in the, in the mines, in the lead mines by Francis Renault. And historians conclude that those people were taken from Haiti. And it is my contention that Dusabo was in search of his people when, because we find him in that same area even though here in the east or in the eastern part of the Mississippi, we, 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 we kind of lay hold of the of Mississippi that he's ours. But people in, in the western part of the Mississippi also have a claim. So people in St. Charles, in St. Louis, especially St. Charles, they have a claim as well because those areas, St. Genevieve, and further, the further south, southern part of this of the state of Illinois, were basically the area where those people were. St. Genevieve now is on the Missouri side. So, and because Dusabo, that's where he was in the beginning. He was in Peoria. That's where he purchased land in Peoria. And then, when he retired from Chicago, he moved down there to St. Charles. And that's where he spent his final days. His granddaughter, Eulalia or Eulalia, she was the one he left in charge of all his belongings after. His son also died there. Jean Dussab died there in 1814. So it is my contention that he was looking to reunite with family members when he left Chicago. All right. And this connection to another question in the chat, actually. Um, okay, some say he traveled um, from Canada into Illinois, while others contend that he um, came to North America through the, um, the Mississippi. Um, which do you believe? Well, now this question is a valid one because because uh, Kwefi made a good 
a good effort trying to, sh to show that there was a family named Du Sable that came from France, directed into Canada and from there to Detroit. And they were present in 1701 when Detroit was founded. And he found people there, he thought Du Sable. He didn't have any direct connection to Du Sable. He thought that since he found a name there, he thought Du Sable might have been from those families. Now, this, this French or Canadian connection, I do not support because I, for several reasons, I just felt that Du Sable was the, the child of, of a white person, a white man, and an enslaved woman, as Quafi claims. I don't know if he could carry the name Du Sable. If the father accepted him and gave him the name, he would also give him other things. Because those families would be wealthy. Remember now, they were part of the founding groups of, the, of Detroit. But in doing my research, I found that we didn't have many Du Sables that had property in Detroit. So the area was given back to the British by 1760. So when census were taken, we didn't find Du Sables with property. And we didn't have any conflict of names trying to figure out who, who is this Du Sable, who is that Du Sable. There was only one Du Sable who actually who was against supporting, reinforcing the fence around the fort of Detroit. And I said, well, if there was a, if, du, if the Dusabo family was instrumental in founding the city, I don't see how they would be against strengthening the, the fort. So plus a lot of the slaves that, that were figured in the census, there were not very many, many of the people who, went, who were enslaved over there were Native Americans and some of the slaves were also blacks, but by that time, it just kind of makes you wonder whether or not there would be, I mean, there would also be something, whether there would be enough for that lucky Dusabo to find a slave girl to bear his child. And even if that happened, Dusabo has no other Dusabos around that to confuse him with. Whereas in St. Charles, where his son lived, there's real problem trying to figure out which to say, was it father, was it the son? Was it junior, was it senior? But in, Saint, but in Detroit, we don't have any such, such conflict. So because of that, and because Dusabo went south to St. Charles, because that's where his people were, his granddaughter was there, his daughter went there to have the child, Eulalia, baptized, and the priest also left the work in. So I feel that all this is compelled that Dusabo is from that area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, if he doesn't have all of that. Yeah. It, it kind of shows how so social networks were actually very important in the, the frontier at the time. Okay. Um, and speaking of Dusabo's family, um, um, we have a question. Uh, does anyone know where his living descendants are today? That's... That question is a good one because nobody does. And it doesn't mean that there is none because Eulalia, Dusabo left all his properties to her and she was responsible to bury him in this, in this, in St. Charles Bohemio Cemetery, Catholic Church Cemetery. And she did that. He left everything to her. His son property, he took possession of. He went to court to take possession of his son property. Everything was left to Eulalia. So Eulalia had a husband. So I would say that she had, she must have had children. Now we don't, maybe they took the names of the, the, the father's name, but I think that in Chicago, we don't have anything. But I think down there, St. Charles, St. Louis, St. Genevieve. 
I think this is the area to look for, even Peoria maybe. But in my research, I didn't find anyone, but it doesn't mean there is nobody. Yeah, so um, we don't really have any questions in the chat right now. So I'm going to sort of ask a question myself. Um, as you know, there's a certain a plaque that kind of credits Kinsey is for founding Chicago and all that stuff. And it's always been kind of an a interesting one, one because it, it explicitly acknowledges DeSalvo being the first person in Chicago, but it doesn't really... Um, it doesn't credit him as the founder and explicitly says, oh, Kinsey's kids were the first white kids born in the city and all that stuff, which is a kind of a very interesting sort of um, issue here, actually. Yeah, well, so if they talk about the first white child, so that could be debatable, but this is not really our intention because the Sabo's children would be mixed because that, that particular population were, that particular population actually, they were in the majority. The children of, of say either blacks or whites and Native Americans, so the, the children of mixed children, there were many. So if Suzanne was born in Chicago, and clearly she would not be qualified as white, and if, if Jean was born in Chicago, if, if Eulalie was born in Chicago, those are the ones we know. We don't know other ones. No. No. Before that, clearly Dusabo took Francis May and Elizabeth Roy, their children accompanied the Dusabos to St. Charles. I mean, two St. Louis to be better. Those children would have been first walks. At least one of the first walks would have been born. Because those people, they were born here. So, and clearly Dusabo took them and the priest in St. In St. Louis recorded that he baptized those children from Chicago. So, so unless he did not identify their, their race, but Francis May is believed was a white person. Elizabeth Roy, we believe was a white lady. So William Met, his wife was Parawani. So, so we could say his children would have been missed. But, so even though this would be pretty interesting, so we really do not debate that part because, because people were passing in the area and some of children would not be qualified as well. So that's basically what we focus on. But if that particular aspect is, you know, well, the Kinsey's were the first world children. Some people say that I've seen that in the literature, but I'd be glad to just give them that because <laughs> it doesn't really hurt me in any way. All right, we, um, we still have time for a few more questions, so um, feel free to put them in the chat or raise your hand if you want to uh, ask them directly out loud. I have one. 
um, Mr. Ozier, kind of, you know, because we have a few copies of your book here at the museum. Um, and as you know, you know, the kind of cultural climate around um, DuSable in Chicago is, is always shifting and changing. And, you know, his name is coming up more and more. I want to know that when you were reading or rather researching and creating your book, what was one of the most interesting facts or interesting things you kind of uncovered? Um, like as we continue to say DuSable's name and recognize him, what is that interesting fact that you learned that we can continue to share and uplift to really uphold the legacy and um, DuSable himself? Yeah. Uh, you know, one thing of all the work that I, that I have done on him, and, and that's a very good question because the one thing, this is someone who makes you proud. Everybody had nothing but praise for him. That this is the person who went the extra mile for people. As we said, when the children were going to be baptized, you know, he's the one with the connections. So he sent his granddaughter, his son-in-law, and his daughter for the shootos to, to, to entertain and down there in St. Louis. But if you notice, it seems to me DuSable tried to help the, the maids because they attached his, their children were attached to shoot to shoot to feast. <coughs> That means junior. So, so, but it looks like DuSable was looking for a way to uplift that family. Unfortunately, though, when DuSable left the area, when, when Francis May was, I would say, poisoned because he ate some food from the Kenzies and died in the woods, nobody knew where he was dead. So the Kenzies charged the money to find him. And he had enough to bury him at that point. He had nothing. Then he was left a couple of a couple of dollars was left, but he only had enough money for his burial. So, so that means we're not doing very well. So trying to help them. Two, when the when the Indians lost the war. The, the war of falling timbers, 1794. So it is recorded that DuSable was there with the Indians. He took them from St. Joseph, Michigan, and to kind of direct them to the to, to Anthony Wayne's tent to try to negotiate a better settlement for the Indians. So he was there with them. That was a very dark moment for the Panawani, for the Chippewa. They lost the war and they could have been wiped out completely. And so the was there. And in the treaty that was signed that Anthony Wayne dictated to the Indians, it's called the Greenville Treaty of 1795. You know that Anthony Wayne wanted a piece of land on the lake front. And that piece of land would be 16 miles by 16 miles. And you know what that would mean? So, DuSable was there. Apparently DuSable, even though he had a lot of property, he was a man of means. It seems to me people meant more to him. It looks like he was a man of a, of a mission, of a vision too, because even in St. Charles, he left everything for one, only one thing he wanted to be buried in the church cemetery. And for a man to leave all his wealth, not, I mean, way before he died, he gave all of that up. All he wanted was to be buried in the church cemetery. So he was looking for something, but what he was looking for was not on this planet. Looks like it was something beyond. 
So he was a person who had a deep connection with some something spiritual. And because he was so detached, even though he had a lot of means, but he didn't really live. He didn't have means. He didn't live for that. So I think that's something someone can be proud of. And I would also add, when he was arrested, of course, there was really no charges brought against him. But when he was arrested, and as I said earlier in my presentation, there was the Indian, the Indian chiefs and the bands, many bands came, descended on the, on the fort, demanding that they release him. And not only that, put him in charge. <laughs> And the Buddha had no choice. So this guy, anyone who knew him, they were just, it was all praise. This is the summa cum laude guy, I'm telling you. Okay. Um, okay, so we have another question about the Sable's family. Um, do you believe that Francis May was related to Du Sable's French father? Well, I mean, we, don't, we wouldn't have anything in the literature of the period to, to make that connection. But I mean, it, it's true that, as I said, so Dusabu sent his granddaughter, his daughter, his son-in-law, Francis May and, and Elizabeth Roy, they went with their children, but there was there is no connection. I mean, as far as we know, there is nothing in the literature. And the Dusabos did get any land when the treaties were signed. You know, many of the many of the Native Americans, or even the whites with connections and Kenzies, they received a lot of land, but the Dusabos had nothing. There was nothing left for them. And then Francis May, so. Okay. So I, I wouldn't know that because I don't have any, any way of making that connection. And that's not to say that it's not true. That didn't happen. We just didn't have any. Okay, sir. We just don't have any way of making the connection. Because many of the connections we make the history kind of support that, or there is a high probability that it was the case. But in this one, we don't have anything. Okay. Uh, so I guess I'm going to ask this because it's a. So okay. Well, we have just a comment from some person that just popped up. Uh, my family name is May. I was uh, researching, so she was just kind of curious that there was any sort of connection there. Um, so I'm going to use this question sort of side to sideline into something else as well. Um, so uh, racial caste systems and like and various different colonial empires were different and all that stuff like and the French seemed a little more flexible with um, um, social status and uh, mixed race relationships than say the English were. Um, could you explain that? Yes. And that's, that is, um, it is, it's kind of a, something in history, especially in the history of the area. The English seem to be a little more into class system and caste system and maintaining in the area. The French, wherever they go, they live with the Indian, they cooperated with the, with the Indian, they intermarried with the Indians. So, and the Indian loved them. So they would build their, their little neighborhoods and then the Indian are right there around them. So for some reason that we don't know what it is that the English were not were as, yes, as much into Native people. So when the French were no longer in the area, 
And that was part of the suspicion against Dusabo because they felt that well, the British were always complaining that the Indians are, in, that the French are encouraging the Indian thinking that they're coming back. The French had lost the war and lost the property, and lost the territory. But the Indians continued to nourish the thought that maybe they, the French would be back. So, so the Sabo, so whatever Francophone, whatever, because all the French culture, so he felt the same way about the, the Indians. But as far as a clear explanation as to why the British are there where they are or were they where they were, but it's all, it's all even, even here, even here where we are today, if you take the Indians out, you take the, the British in the, in the East, it's the same thing. We don't, have, we don't have what the Spanish had or what the French had as far as mixing with the native people. It's a high percentage of the Spanish and, and the French mixing with the native people. And that's why some of the terms we have today, like Creole or Mestizo or mixed people, those are all coming from those languages because those people had, the English, clearly the English had some, but it just had nothing compared to what the French and the Spanish had. <laughs> man, a mystery. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Um, now, extending upon like the the whole concept of race in um, the New World, I, I, I guess I want to ask a question. Like, what was the impact of the Haitian Revolution in Illinois and for a person like Dusable and all that stuff? And of course, how how do we associate him with the revolution down there and? Uh, his legacy here in Chicago. Uh, the Haitian Revolution, the impact was huge throughout the United States and even over here. So we, we kind of kind of pretty much away here. We in the West. So this is a. So this is far away from the center of the, of the country. So the Haitian Revolution, so beginning with 1791, the Bukman Revolution, so created a huge problem for, this, for the slave system throughout the Americas. Because the Haitians basically telling all the enslaved people that it can be done and the insurrection that occurred there shook everybody. I mean, that I, I quoted Jefferson, what he was saying about the Haitian Revolution. Hamilton, I mean, everybody was shaken, the Haitian Revolution. So what they were looking for is for a way for the Haitians to actually to be drowned, to lose, so they would not be but that was kind of a, a delicate type of dance going on. The Haitians, Toussaint was working with the United States, helping the United States, thinking that he would find allies, but he had to be very, very careful. So John Adam, the second president of the US, I have two letters in the book that Toussaint sent to him. So Toussaint was responsible to make sure that the Americans' business was, taking, was, was going on in Haiti. In fact, it was reported in Congress and how, how, how when Toussaint was in charge, how the Americans were making profit. Their business was being done properly. Toussaint made sure that they got paid. Because the French had a problem with the, with the rebelling states. So the French worked hard for, the, for America to become independent. Without the French, America would not be here. Because the French, clearly, the British took away all this land from them. So they were angry. So they wanted to find a way to get back at the British. So if they, if they find ways to help America become independent, 
So that would be a huge market for French, for the French business, for the French economy. So they have the, the Americans, but when the Americans became independent, unfortunately, as the, way the, the way the French saw it, the Americans were kind of going back to the British because the British still held where we are today until 1796. All this area was still in the hands of the British. So, so the Americans found ways to work with the British to start making deals with the British. And the French became jealous. So they were very unhappy with the Americans because they felt that the, the Americans had already made deals with them and the Americans owed them tons of money that they paid for their independence. And now, they kind of align themselves too closely to the British. So, but at that time, the American, the British, um, I mean, the French who started to get angry with the Americans. The French pirates were seizing American ships. But the Haitians, and Toussaint, decided to protect American ships, allowing Americans to come to, to trade in Haiti. The Americans love that, but there's something called racism or the fear of slavery, the fear of the slave insurrection. So they liked the work Toussaint was doing. They reported in Congress, Adam gave high praise to Toussaint. There's something called the Toussaint Clause. The Toussaint Clause was that they'll protect Americans' ship, they'll make sure Americans get paid. They're reporting how Americans are making profit now. But when it comes to, to, to the slave staff, when Napoleon decided to send troops to Haiti to reconquer the land, uh, by that time, the third president came to power. That was the, after the revolution, that was after the election of 1800, when, the, when Adam lost power. Then Jefferson came into power. Jefferson opened his arm, said yes, he would help Napoleon. They would crush Toussaint. Or you would stop. Of course, the Americans, and I made the point in the book, the Americans had no idea what Napoleon wanted. What Napoleon wa really wanted was to unite Haiti with Louisiana. And you know what Louisiana means? It's, four, it's 13 states, not just the state of Louisiana. Louisiana is 13 states. So, so that was Napoleon's idea. But so the Haitians were left alone to fight the wars of the, you know, Napoleon was fighting everybody and was winning too. But his back was broken in Haiti. And I hope you, you know, this, the history is Napoleon chose the best soldiers from, from around the world. He could put his hand on to send to Haiti to make sure he sent his sister, he sent his brother-in-law to make sure that they did not lose that battle. So they ended up losing. So this stuff was very unnerving to the Americans, because again, to the, to the slaveholders. So what would happen now? All these slaves winning wars? <laughs> this is a problem. So this... And anything that happens in America, all the NCA, all the slave insurrections after that will always blame on the Haitians. And the Haitians were not without blame or not, they, they wanted slavery to end. So they were supporting some of that. In fact, I showed in the book later on, YA sent, Amer sent Haitians emissaries throughout the United States to invite black people to come to Haiti. He'll pay their fare to come to Haiti. So this is your country. And you want, if, if you touch, if your feet touch the soil of Haiti, you feel no one can touch you. So this is how the Haitians help Venezuela, Colombia, all these countries. All, all they had to do was to end slavery. So they gave them a lot of ammunition, printing prayers, everything they gave them to go fight the Spanish just to end slavery. That's all they had to promise. Oliver had to make a promise that he will end slavery. That's all he had to do. So, in North America over here, with all of this going on, 
Anything that happens, they blame the Haitians for insurrections. So when DuSable surfaced over here, this is why the book has the subtitle or Haitian secret agent, because the, the, the belief was DuSable was going to make Chicago a colony of black people and that whites would be excluded. This is what Wentworth was a congressman, also mayor of the city of Chicago. This, this was his message. Those are the people. So those, his message that if DuSable did not leave this area, it would be hard for a white person to go out. So why the Haitian revolution? And they started to, to associate Haiti with everything bad. And okay. DuSable would be. Um, okay. Um, we got time for one more question. Um, Marilyn actually has her hands raised. Um, feel free to unmute yourself and um, ask out loud. Yeah, hi. Hi, Dr. Rosier. Um, you just kind of touched on my question. I, I was going to say, uh, because of, of, of the, um, the um, impact that, that Haiti had in those early days, is that still why Haiti is kind of frowned upon and looked at, um, viewed negatively uh, by um, America. Yes, so in the book, I made a point to show after the earthquake in Haiti, the, the Dr. Saint Frontier, the Dutch was at borders, they were shocked to find that the American Air Force was there at the airport in Haiti. They were turning away, playing loads of supplies to take care of the Haitians. I said, what's going on? So there, are, so there are a couple of reasons. America has never forgiven Haiti for what happened. Now, what, so in the book, I have a, I have a, a chapter called the Night Strike. So I see America as a vassal of the French. So during the medieval time, there was a system called the oath of vassalage or vassalage. There are certain people who are vassals. That means they are the servants of, of the higher class people. And that's a very serious thing. So their responsibility is to fight their wars to make sure that those people are taken care of. Those people are part of all types of secret societies and things. I'm not really going to make any allegation of how, well, but anyway. So many of the French officers came here to fight for America. Many of them, like Rochambeau, his father was, Rochambeau, you guys may not recognize him, but his statue is all over the United States. His son, was defeated in Haiti. So many of these guys were working for America. Because remember, these guys are part of certain societies. They came here to work for something, for the Novus Ordo Seclorum, the new order of things. Here's these Africans trying to derail this program. So many of these guys died there. And in the book, I made a point to show how America was thanking these guys for all the things. Remember, the French got the independence for America. America became independent in 1783. They declared independence in 1776, but they could not win the war. So these people sacrificed a lot, but the wealth actually came from me. And that's another point I made. The Americans actually misplaced their affection. They put the affection on the French but the French did not have money. It was the slaves who were working. Haiti was the richest colony. It was working. They were starving themselves. And the money was given to America to be independent, to get back at the British, and also to find, find people to, to trade with. So the Americans, to this day, they will not forgive Haiti. Those people do not forget. About 70,000 Frenchmen died over there. 
And, and there was a lot involved. So to this day, they will not. Doesn't matter what America says. America will not help Haiti because that's something. That's a place they don't like because it's like they sworn oath to defend the French. Night, that's why I call it night strike. The night will strike back. They will do anything they can. They seize Haitian property, La Navas. I mean, they'll do anything to make sure the country doesn't make it. Doesn't matter what they say. The proof is right there. The poorest, the ones, the richest. Rosier, thank you so much for sharing all your research and contributions to the Haitian community and the Haitian diaspora. Um, if you haven't already, make sure to go get a copy of the book, Chicago's Authentic Founder, with the with the subtitle Jean-Baptiste Point du Sable, or Haitian Secret Agent in the Old Northwest Outpost, 1745 to 1818. Um, really fantastic. I'm so happy you were able to join us um, this evening. Ben, thank you very much for another great and insightful Q&A session. I'm really happy we were able to have a, a really vivid conversation and answer some really, really impactful questions. Before we go really quickly, I just want to make um, two announcements. Um, the first one, tomorrow is May 1st, which means that it is Haitian Heritage Month. And this year, the museum will be celebrating all month long with programs, lectures, and a new exhibition, as well as a raffle. Um, so make sure to keep an eye on our social media and to check out our website, www.hammock.org, for more information and details that will be coming out um, within the next few days. And also, secondly, our first program that will be happening during Haitian Heritage Month um, is going to be on the Haitian Revolution, presented by... Mr. Ben Henderson, who is in the chat and who just did the Q&A. This program is in collaboration with Macbeth Academy, which is a K through 12 online school in Maryland. Um, this will be a free event and it's happening on May 6th from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. Central Time. Again, thank you all so much for being here with us this evening. Go get the book, make sure you get the book. It's a really good read. Um, Mr. Rosier, thank you so much, Ben. Thank you so much, Marilyn, Leidana. Elsie, thank you so much for being here this evening. Enjoy your weekend. Have a wonderful rest of your evening. And I hope to see you soon at one of our programs in the future. Thank you so much, everyone. I appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye.